So as a as a trauma surgeon, these things like that don't phase me at all. You get used to things just going wrong at the last minute. You just keep on going. But I just really, truly want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come listen to this, this lecture. Because I think this is the most important topic in medicine today, which is the intersection of health and public policy, and particularly how we as doctors can use our positions and this knowledge to become better advocates for our patients and our profession. So a lot of my advocacy has been with gun violence prevention. But I'll just be very clear, like what we're talking about today is so much bigger than the epidemic of gun violence. It's bigger than that. But we'll use that as a launching point for these other issues that we're gonna talk about today. Now, this is data from the CDC 2021. It was a record year. That was the most gun violence deaths on record in the United States. We see a lot of a lot of headlines, but for me, you know, if you, you know me, whenever I give a talk, there's gonna be some talk about racial justice in that talk, and when I look at these numbers, I see these through the lens of racial justice. So I think about the stories that are not being told. So just think, within 24 hours of this talk today, at least half of the firearm-related deaths will be young black men. Intimate partner violence. If there's a firearm present, a woman is five times more likely to be killed by her domestic abuser. Black women, three times more likely than white women. And I'm sure we've all heard that guns are now the leading cause of death for children in this country. So that inflection point occurred in 2021. You see firearms crosses the line here past motor vehicles. Does anybody know the prior 10 years, what was the leading cause of death for black children and teens in the US? Leading cause, then a leading question. It was firearms, right? It was firearms then. So this is an important part. And like when you leave today, I want you to have some information and some knowledge to become more effective, but also understand that the narratives that we share, the ones that we amplify, and the ones that we minimize also influence policy. And policy, like research, has the opportunity to impact the lives of millions beyond what you will see in the operating room or in, or in the clinic where you see patients. Now, you may ask yourself, Williams, why should I be listening to you about all this trauma surgeon? I admit I was not always as enlightened as I am now, but I'm on this path now and I feel obligated to share this info with as many people as possible. But it took a tragedy to really wake me up to how I should be having more impact beyond the hospital. Now I want you to take yourself back to 2016, that summer, another election year. This time was between uh, Clinton and Trump. But there have also been several mass shootings that year and several officer-involved shootings, killings of young Black men. So on July 5th, you remember, there was the shooting of Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge. On July 6th, the shooting of Philando Castile in Minnesota. That one made big news because that was live streamed on Facebook. Your girlfriend in the driver or passenger seat, Philando was in the, in the driver's seat, shot and killed within 20 seconds of the cop coming to his window. One of the one of the bullets pierced his heart. July 7th, there were protests scheduled all across the country to raise awareness of this issue. But even the month before that, we had the mass shooting at the uh, Pulse nightclub in Orlando. This is one of those years that there was just a lot of death and violence that was kind of crescendoing throughout that summer. If you remember those protests, there's probably only one that you remember, that's the one in Dallas, because that is the one that turned violent. Of all the ones across the country, this is the one that turned violent. There are about 400 pro protesters downtown Dallas. 
Dallas police officers providing security for the event. And there was one lone sniper there who was there targeting police officers. Shot 14 police officers. And it just happened to be that that night, I was on call at Parkland Hospital. Initially, it was my night off. My, um, my partner asked me, he said, hey, can you take my shift this night? Which I did. And I think about that decision to, to say yes. Now, everything from that point on has changed for me. The 14 officers were shot. Seven were brought to Parkland Hospital where I was on call. And the trauma team, you know, we were trained for this. We respond to mass shootings. And it was just business as usual. Pager kept going off. There are more coming in. We had no idea what was going on downtown. There was talk. There were bombs placed around the city. We had to secure the hospital. The police pulled their AR-15s out of storage, patrolled the hospital, secured all entry points. If you were visiting, you could not walk through the hallways. You had to stay in a room. Some of the officers arrived, three critically injured, died of their wounds. And it's a night I still think about every day. I still think about this night every day. Some, some things just happened to you that just kind of change how you view the world. And this was a night for me. And it was a point where I had to go deliver news to one of the family members about the death of their, their son, grown man, police officer, done this talk countless times, and I always want to get it right. When someone loses a family member, think it was to gun violence, you have, and you're not expecting it that day, I do not want to add trauma on top of what could be a pretty traumatic event. Deliver the news, talk to the family when I left the uh, the room that they were in, across from me, my about from me to you, Dr. Angelos, there was a police officer that was on post. Because during the event, we shut down the hospital, on-duty and off-duty police officers came to the hospital to support their injured colleagues. But also, they put one on post at all of the rooms of the family members and all of the rooms of the injured officers as well as the deceased officers. So I walk out, I see him, and there's a moment where I could, if I turn right, it goes back into the trauma center where there's activity, but we are now past that initial phase of the mass casualty event. Uh, if you work in emergency medicine, trauma, when there's a mass casualty, there is an initial uptick of activity when they're rushing in with the ambulances, then there's a down tick for a while, just in routine care, then later the walking wounded come in. So we were in this low point where they didn't actually need me. The nurses and residents and other, you know, other doctors can work fine without me there. So I took a left, went down this back hallway, walked through these double doors, doors closed behind me, and it was just silence. I fell to the floor. I was crying. And I, I'm not someone who cries, but there I was that night on the floor crying. But eventually, just to get back up and go to work, right? This is what we do in healthcare. Crisis is not the time to take uh, inventory of your emotions. Patients need you, your team needs you, you get back to work. I got up off the floor, went back to work, and our team worked throughout the, the entire night. The, the mayor came by, the chief of police, news organizations were there. We did our job to take care of these police officers, civilians that were injured, and never stopped operations. Continue to see car accidents and other injuries that came in that night. Now, I don't know if you know for you, there's, there's those moments in, that happen to you that just change who you are. And you really start to think like, what are you doing? Should you be doing something different? And that was what that night was for me. That was a Thursday night. I went back to work the next day, the next day, the next day, just doing what I do best, just locking that all in some box. It didn't happen. Just get back to work, Brian. You're a trauma surgeon, get back to work. Monday came, so the 11th, partner calls me up, says, hey, we're gonna have a press conference this day. You're on call that night, we need you there for this press conference. And you've seen these press conferences, right? After a mass shooting, they kind of follow a certain script. I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to this press conference. I have no desire to be there. I'm still replaying this night on a loop in my head. Don't want to be there. You guys can handle this without me. It'll be just fine. Because I know how it's going to go. Send a text to my wife. Say, hey, there's going to be a press conference at one o'clock. 
just so you know, I'm not going, but you may want to check it out. 10 seconds later, my phone is ringing. Pick it up, it's my wife. Now this is where her story and my story diverge. <laughs> you can talk to her and she will say that she's a very supportive spouse. And she is, I tell you that. Like they said, behind any successful man is a woman rolling her eyes. That's, that's my one, right? I will tell you she can be a very directive spouse as well. And she said, oh, you're going to that press conference. You have to go. You need to get over yourself because this is bigger than you, right? You've been checked out these past few days on the news. It's Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. You're saying Black men are evil and violent, deserve to die. You don't go to that press conference. People will not know that there was a Black doctor there that night trying to save these police officers. You just go there, just sit there, just be seen. Now think about that. I'm still trying to wrestle with that years later that just to be seen on camera is gonna make a difference, which is a powerful statement about race in this country still to this day. But for all of us, is in a statement about if you wanna make a difference, right? If you want to make a difference, you cannot make a difference if you do not show up. You have to at least show up and be present to make a difference. So go to this press conference and sitting there at the table and I'm listening to them, listening to them talk about this, this incident and this wasn't sitting right with me. Like the narratives, right? The narratives that we amplify make a difference. The narratives that we minimize also make a difference. And what was not being said bothered me more than what was being said. Now I'm thinking to myself, and Brian, are you going to speak up? You showed up. I've done my part, but are you going to speak up now? What do you truly stand for? Because if it's not you, it will be nobody. And if it's not now, then when? But I'm thinking to myself, if I say something, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose some of my friends. And I'm thinking about that. And all that happened within, you know, you just think of the pros and cons within a second in your, your, in your brain, right? Next thing you know, I was told that I wasn't speaking at this event, but somehow the microphone ended up in front of me and then I decided to speak up. There was an added dynamic of officers getting shot. We need to be careful and make the gunshot victims. But the preceding days of more black men dying at the hands of police officers affected me. I think the reasons are obvious. I fit that demographic of individuals. But I adore what has been done to these officers. And I do look at I understand the anger and the frustration and the distrust of law enforcement. But they are not the problem. The problem is the lack of open discussions about the impact of race relations in this country. I think about it every day. But I'm able to stay in the cup in the future that night. The way all my mind constantly. The chin would have to stop. Black men dying and being forgotten. People retaliating against the people that want to defend us. We have to come together. And you know this. It still really gets me when I see that video and think about what happened. But I recognize that sometimes you just have to go through the fire. We're going to make a difference. Right. And looking back now, 
I know that that moment, that's when this ding, just rang the bell on the countdown timer on my career as a trauma surgeon in Dallas at that time. Because after that, everything changed. Relationships with my colleagues and friends and family, but more so was the internal change. Like thinking to myself, okay, I've been doing all this stuff. I trained to do all these things, but is this enough? Can I be doing more? And it was from there is what actually brought me to Chicago. It was to be part of the new trauma center that y'all opened up here and help serve the South Side community. That's like just in line with what I wanted to be doing to affect systemic change. Anybody recognize this map, seen it before? This is a gun violence tracker that's published in the Chicago Tribune. It used to be weekly every couple of weeks. I'm not sure if they're still doing it now, years later, but back then it was a pretty frequent, um, almost weekly, they show all the gun violence deaths. The red dots are the gun violence deaths in Chicago. You can filter it, but the blue dots are the injuries, non, non lethal injuries. So I just put it down to, to the red dots. And you can see, you know, UFC is down in here, that's the west side over here. And most of these deaths are young black men. It's 2020. I got here in 2019. That few months later, COVID comes. And like many people in this country suddenly became an infectious disease expert during a COVID, right? We're all talking about how, how much we know about COVID. But I had a reason because I was co-director of the ICU and it was changing our operations in the ICU because uh, we had to take this care of this influx of COVID patients. So I began to follow what the Department of Public Health was putting out about infections and deaths. And look at the purple dots. These are the deaths due to COVID infections. Uh, this is June of 2020. And just take note of where the purple dots are compared to that. Moving forward, six months later, we finally get a vaccine. Vaccines are going out. Look at the, the blue diagram. The, the darker the blue, that's the highest uptake of vaccines. The lighter the blue, no vaccines. Gun violence, deaths. COVID deaths, vaccines. So I'm starting to say, huh. Oh. Been my whole life worried about trying to end gun violence. Now I'm starting to see how this is all connecting with the once in a century pandemic, putting these two side by side. So I'm sitting, I'm actually sitting in my office while I'm looking at this, this, this uh, diagram. So think about like, what do you actually see with this map here? Just think about it, you know, just throw it out, give you a second, like what do you see when you see this? I told you it was gun violence deaths, right? But remove all of the labels and what I see is the manifestation of structural racism, right? And you can change these dots to oh, probably maternal mortality, uncontrolled diabetes, late stage diagnosis of can cancer, that's just within health, move on, you know, education, jobs, there's so much in this map beyond just gun violence. So now I'm getting restless once again. I've already made one huge career jump. I'm getting restless again, like this, there's got to be more, okay? Done the teaching, done the operating, done my bit in research, but this all today is about policy and advocacy, right? How do we use our positions to change things that will impact systems so we can improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of millions of people and everyone in this audience is in a position to do that. So what I chose to do was start really thinking about how all these things interplay, right? We talk about structures, we talk about the social determinants of health, those things that we, where we live, work and play that impact our health, nothing to do with what I'm doing in the operating room or in the clinic. Now let's think about how we spend our money. This diagram just focused on the green, okay? 
Just focus on the green. Determinants here, 6% that impacts our health outcomes is due to access of care, access to care. 90% of our medical services money we spent of the $2.6 trillion is spent on trying to improve access to care. We talk a lot about access to affordable care. Important, 6% of the outcomes. Now granted 20% genetics can impact that. Healthy behaviors, that's on our patients. But social, economic, and physical environments, that's down here in the 1% that we spend. I just think about what can we do to improve the lives of our patients if we were able to shift some of that money to these non-access to care services. And think about when you're listening to the news. When you're hearing this on the news, when you're at your conferences, when you're talking about this, access, 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 you should be thinking access and what? Because there is more to do to really want to have a really truly big impact. And that's where being an inform and impactful physician advocate can make the difference. So I knew I was done in the OR for then. I said, I said, okay, Brian, you gotta do something different now. And I'll tell you, people thought I lost my mind. You're gonna do what? You're not gonna operate for and go do policy? And Come on, man, you're gonna be crazy. You lost your mind. I said, look, I just, this, this is where, this is the next phase of impact to be able to combine this with what I've known and done. So I applied for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellowship. If anybody's interested in this, you should, we should talk because it is the most immersive fellowship in the country and it was transformative for me and I see the world differently and I feel like I am super powered now. And now my job is to share as much information with you as I can in the time we have left to make you supercharged as, as well. This is meant for mid-career professionals in this picture, you see three doctors, three nurses, and a civil rights attorney. So multidisciplinary. And we arrive as subject matter experts so we can have impact right away. They give us a policy process experience. So it's a bi-directional benefit. And you get just thrown in and you get to work. You don't sit around doing nothing. They, they expect a lot from us. And it was here, I learned quite a few things, but one of the biggest things is about money. Right now, this is in jest, but I think it illustrates a point, a point, a point about how money really impacts our healthcare system. Some would say we have actually have a sick care system, not a healthcare system, because we are driven by illness. I think about my profession. Right, the more cases I do, the more RVUs I generate. That relies on people getting shot. Right. So we're constantly trying to work ourselves out of a job. So here's the part for you, okay? You're all the experts, healthcare experts. How are you gonna combine that with policy to have impact and make a difference? And there's three things that we're gonna talk about here. First is who makes health policy. I'm gonna take for granted that we kind of understand executive branch, legislative branch, judiciary. I'm not gonna go into Congress, the presidency and Supreme Court. You all get that. It's that next level down, the, the public sector and the private sector. Public sector, we're thinking local, state and federal governments, but also in the private sector, there's so many areas where you can have influence in policy, whether it's within your own hospital, your own department, local nonprofits, community organizations, Policy is being made in a lot of different places. The advantage I have now is that having been at the federal level, I can see how the big P policy there interconnects down to the little P policy that's gonna impact all of our day to day. So if you wanna have impact, there are many areas where you can pull a lever to make a difference. Who makes a good policy? Now, values. Just take a minute to look at this because what we value as academics is not necessarily the same thing that they value as an elected official or, or a policymaker. But there are some similarities or some subtleties and diff some subtle differences. We 
We want to publish. And they want to get in the news. We are subject matter experts. We got a mile deep. They're a mile wide. They're covering a lot of things, mile wide, inch deep. And that's where I had a chance to become, go from being a subject matter expert to broadening it out to many, many different uh, areas of influence. Teaching, ran around, visiting, visiting professor, lectures in class. They're doing meet and greets for their constituents. So you can see some of the values are different. So we know who makes policy, the values, similarities, but some differences. Next is the thought process, because the way we think is not necessarily the way that they think. We want to get things done at the policy level. You need to understand who you're working with. All right. We problem statement, lit search methods. They're looking, what is this issue? What is the issue we're talking about? What does the current law say? And then because of positions, what have they said in the past as a member? Are they flip-flopping? What does a party say? Are they in line with what the party says? And who are the major stakeholders? And we in healthcare consider yourself as a stakeholder in all of this as well. So values, who makes policy in the thought process, having knowledge of that can make you a more impactful position advocate. You put all that together, that's politics. That is the art of the possible. That's how you make big change, right? But they need our voices at the table. So just remember those three things, who makes it, values in the process. And there's one more thing that everyone in this room has that a lot of people just do not have that's gonna make you a superstar, to make you a super doc advocate, that you have the stories that a few others have, like you're caring for the patients. You can tell what, these, what this means to your patients. And pick your issue. It doesn't have to be about patient care. Physician payment reform. What it's like to get, try to get paid. Prior authorization. What it's like to call over and over again to get your patient the medication that they need for the care that they, that they need. Go on and on. It's not just about direct patient care. But it's like all the things within healthcare that impact our profession and the patients that we're trying to serve. And the stories are important. This became... Real evident, May 2022. This is the mass shooting at Rob Elementary High School, or Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Gunmen, 19 students, two teachers, injured, seven, injured 17 others. This was mass shooting that once again just kind of captivated the, the nation. It was a story that cannot be ignored. At the time, I was serving as a health policy advisor in the office of Senator Chris Murphy. If you're from Connecticut, you know him because he's your senator. If you do not know Murphy, he is the leading voice in Congress for gun violence prevention. When he was in, in the House of Representatives, Sandy Hook was in his district. So when Sandy Hook happened, that's when he shifted a lot of his attention to what he could do as far as gun violence prevention. I was in his office. And at the time, I was not working on any gun violence issues. It was other things. Uh, pandemic preparedness, GME funding, uh, diversity in clinical trials, a lot of things that were healthcare related, but had nothing to do with gun violence. And then one day within 48 hours, all that changed. Chief of staff comes in and says, hey, Brian, we're putting together this team. We're going to do something about gun violence. You're on the team. I said, oh. well, I said, all right, I know gun violence. This is something I can really contribute to. He said, oh. By the way, you all have a month to get it done. Nothing happens in a month, right? Especially something we haven't done in 30 something years, but we did it. Passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. This was the most significant gun safety bill in a generation. Did a lot of things, back, enhanced background checks, victims of inter intimate partner violence. Uh, I'm Really proud of this part here about the CVI programs, money for the communities to address community-based violence, right? Because we have to collaborate with those in the community that are closest to the problem to get these solutions. And a lot of it happens with the money. So this, this bill was just transformative. And they're still talking about the impacts 
impact of it today. So as far as gun violence, we still continue to make progress. The next year, the Office of White House Office, the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention was established, first in its history. Just a few months ago, Surgeon General, first public health advisory declaring gun violence a public health crisis. And a few weeks ago, uh, President Biden, more executive actions for gun violence prevention. So you can see the importance of being patient in our advocacy, right? You do the work and it may not pay off for a generation or two later. But they say the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. Second best time to plant it is now. <laughs> like if there's things that's, that bother you that you want change, it may not happen quickly, Policy can help, you make a difference, but you have to be patient and just do the work now, see it pay off in the future. Now, Congress is doing their thing, the executive branch, remember the three branches of government, Supreme Court, they're still doing some things out there, doing some things, making, it, making us still work to keep people from safe from gun violence. But that's, that's the beauty of our system and just understanding that there are multiple ways that you can have impacts as far as policy. And we're coming, to, we're coming towards the end here, coming towards the end. I just want to share with you some resources. If you want to do a deeper dive into some of these issues afterwards. A couple books, website, peer-reviewed paper. The first book, Political Determinants of Health. Who's heard of this book in the room? Okay, a couple of hands. Highly recommend this. Daniel Dawes, who's now the head of global health at Meharry. Talk about the social determinants of health. This is the political determinants of health, and it really will open your eyes about how policy impacts health equity. Want to learn about the economics of healthcare? Have to recommend Priced Out by Uwe Reinhardt, one of the leading health economists, died a couple like a year or two ago. It's a thick book, it's dense, but if you just get the book and look at the diagrams and read the captions, that will give you an education that will put you far ahead of anyone else. So that's all you need to do. Diagrams, captions, PhD, okay? <laughs> For gun violence prevention, I, I like gun, Gunfight by Adam Winkler. He's a professor at, um, I think it's, it's either USC or UCLA. But it's one of the books I think is, is very nuanced about both sides of this debate. And it's a very good historical lesson, but it's also written in a great narrative. It's you reading this, it is a mystery thriller that's taking you from beginning to end. So highly recommend that book as well. For websites, a lot of online resources. I understand there's a lot of the gun violence, uh, gun violence prevention organizations out there, Brady, um, Every Town, um, Giffords. However, I'm reckon because you all know about those probably. I'm, re I'm recommending Rand because it is nonpartisan and evidence-based and they're updating stuff every year. So I recommend that. And as far as connection between redlining and gun violence today, this paper came out um, preventive medicine a couple of years ago, but it's still getting cited by a lot of different uh, follow-on work. Those are resources I recommend if you wanna do a deeper dive, but we're not done yet. We are not done, okay? I kind of touched on redlining we looked at the map of Chicago earlier. Let's do, talk a little bit more about what that means for us and how policy can make a difference. Good policy can help a lot of people. Bad policy can hurt a lot of people. And bad policy can be durable over generations. So this is what's called the residential security map of Atlanta in 1938, also known as a red line map. Now, if you're not familiar with redlining, there was a time in our country's history where the Homeowners Lending Corporation, which is a federal uh, department that was giving out low interest loans to people to buy houses in developed communities, they would redline the maps of certain areas and say that that is a poor investment risk. Basically saying, do not buy property there, do not loan money for people to buy houses there. We're not gonna develop that area. The areas that are redlined were communities of color. Okay? So what happens? You're not investing in homes, businesses go away, no money for education. It's just a vicious cycle 
which leads to endemic violence as well. This map is of Atlanta. I did my fellowship in Atlanta at Grady Hospital. Most of my gun violence victims came from this area down here. 70 years later after this map. So the decisions we make as far as policy are durable and they can hurt people for generations. We need good policy to undo that. It does not happen overnight. We must be patient, but we as doctor advocate advocates have to be part of the solution. Well, so I've had a lot of whiplash changes in my career the past couple of years from going to taking time off from clinical work, going to DC. And I was like, you know, I'm still not done. So I decided I was gonna run for Congress as Dr. Angelos mentioned. I, did you all know there's only 19 doctors in Congress? Out of 535 members of Congress, there's only 19 doctors. If you add that for anybody with any sort of health background, nurses, uh, therapists, it's about 25 or 26. Not a whole lot, considering, and you consider how important health care and health policy is in the country, we need more of us at, at the table. So I decided to run decided to run for Congress. Open seat, I'm going to be the first trauma surgeon in Congress. Try to be, do my part to make a difference at the policy level. It's okay, my election was stolen from me <laughs> during the primary, and it's okay because my own party did it to me. It's my own party did it to me. But you get, you take your licks, you get up, and you fight another, fight another day. And I'm going to show you the campaign launch video. So I think this kind of shows a story about why I do the things I do and why I continue to do this work to try to make the world a better place. And trigger warning, okay? I ran as a Democrat in a Democratic district that was safe, a bunch of, against, um, a bunch of other Democrats. So to my Republican colleagues, we were still friends, okay? But the point is we need more people with critical thinkers working on, more people with critical thinking skills working on policy. Three police officers died on my watch in the nearest world. Those officers were protecting young people. Young people protesting the deaths of Black men, innocent Black men. In that moment, one thing was clear. We need change. And I don't know if that's a to TV, a Black man and understand that I support you, I will defend you, and I will care for you. That doesn't mean that I do not fear you. As a trauma surgeon, I had to pronounce too many children dead on arrival due to gun violence, telling mothers and fathers they would never again see their child alive. I think about it every day, but I was unable to save those cops when they came here that night. This killing, it has to stop. We have to come together and in all this. I realized to protect our families, I had to work beyond the operating room. I chaired the Dallas Citizens Police Review Board, and we channeled our grief into building that trust between law enforcement and the community. After the Uvalde, I helped Democratic leaders craft the first bipartisan gun safety law in nearly 30 years, a law that will make it harder for dangerous people to get a gun. But from the front lines, I can tell you, it shouldn't take a crisis to force your own needs to the table. We Democrats have to be relentless in a fight for what's right, even when it's hard. I'm running for Congress to stop these murders and the extremists who defend weapons of war on our streets. I'm Brian Williams. I'm asking you to help me be a voice for the people we've lost because we owe it to them to build the future we deserve. Right, you don't need camera, microphone, or campaign video to make a difference, right? Just stand up for something, speak your truth, and just be a person of service. I want to thank the leadership of the McLean Center, School of Medicine, Department of Surgery for having me today. Special shout out to Dean Aurora. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hudson Tritter for taking care of all the logistics. Appreciate it. And to all of you for your time today, um, do, What's going on here? Connect with me on uh, LinkedIn so we can uh, go create the world we want that we deserve. 
Thank you very much for your time today.